We are here at American Clean Power 2023 in New Orleans, Louisiana with Aronis. And if you don't know Aronis, you have been missing out on a lot because Aronis is the robot repair company, company for blades and towers now. Uh, so I have Dinas Cruz and Greta Cremina here to tell us all the great details that have happened over the last year and all the new technology because we are looking at your booth things and there are five, six, seven different robots here this year, which some of them I've never seen before. So you want to describe what you have brought to New Orleans? Yeah, we brought uh, our internal crawler and we brought the uh, power cleaning robot and all of the set for leading edge repair. Okay. And since the leading edge repair needs like a lot of steps to do the job, so yeah. we have a lot of attachments for the robot to do those those steps. Basically a modular system for the leading edge repair. That's what we have launched now in the US. Okay, so let's talk leading edge repair. As we know across the United States and the world, leading edge damage is so widespread that basically every wind turbine has some level of leading edge damage. So for the easy stuff, well, what I saw the category one through three, what's your approach to repair that, which doesn't involve any anything structural to go on? I, I assume that's a pretty straightforward process for the robot to, to repair and to clean up and to prevent future erosion. Yeah. yeah. So let's say if it's level, like if you build a new turbine, yeah, and it doesn't have the leading edge uh, uh, like protection. Uh, our technology is faster for application of the leading edge protection than for the humans on the ground, like up tower. We can do the job up tower faster than the humans on on the ground. Okay, so you're saying if you use like the the 3M tape kind of material that we've all seen, or the shells, is the other possibility there. You're saying your system, you can put your system on faster on turbine and they can't put their shell system on on the ground. Yeah. Wow. That's if it's level zero, like like basically sure. new turbine. If it's level one erosion, like new turbine a few years, uh, level one, level two, we need approximately one to maximum two days to restore the leading edge and apply a new layer of leading edge protection to, to protect the, the basically the blades. Okay. And if it's level three, we will probably need two to three days uh, because there's a little bit more of sanding, a little bit more of filler application. And, Unevenness. And, yeah, so to make it even and smooth again okay. and so on. So it's fairly, very, very fast process. To apply. What I'm saying and comparing to is that instead of having two human arms, you have at least four human arms working at the same time. That, that's what the robot does. <laughs> So there's there's a there's a stage process to this, right? We're, we're, you're going to try to fix the damage that's there. I assume you're going to apply some sort of filler and try to provide some get the aerodynamic smoothness back. Yeah. And is that one robot application to yes. do that? Okay. Yes. So the robot has a lot of sensors, like laser sensor to to determine like the shape of the leading edge. So we don't measure by the eye, we measure by the laser, we know where it needs to be sanded off, where it needs to be applied a little bit more and so on. Okay. And so it's a very, very precise system. Uh, you can't do that by hand, you can't no. do that by eye. Okay, so then if you get the surface basically reestablished, get it back to some normal shape, then you're coming back over top of that with a leading edge protection material. Yes. And that's a separate robot application. We have two separate robot applications for uh, for leading edge protection. One is sprayable, which Greta sa uh, says it's like, uh, which sprays even layer of leading edge protection. Okay. Another one is like a spatula system, similar when you're applying filler, but uh, it's a little bit different. Okay. But then we apply leading edge protection in very smooth layer uh, of leading edge protection, also a very even layer of leading edge protection. It's a two-stage process. So you can either do a spray coating or a liquid coating liquid that's coating, sort of that's applied a little more. Basically, any coating which is applied by by uh, roller, we yeah. can apply with our system. Okay. A little bit different way. Sort of like a spatula, spatula way. Spatula application, yeah. Oh, okay. What it gives that the surface afterwards is not like an orange peel, but very, very smooth, which yeah. is very good for aerodynamics. Yes, okay. And are, what's the base material? I know people ask all the time, what's the, what's the LEP material you're using? 
is, is there a certain, does it Technos, is it? We work with ExxonMobil and Mankiewicz right okay. now, but we are open to work also with other manufacturers. Okay. Uh, we believe like what we see in the industry that it's sort of religion uh, of the materials which perform best. Like you go sure. to one customer and they say that this manufacturer is the best, this material is the best. And this is, no, this is completely bad material. And then you go to another one and he says like, no, 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 this is the, good, the best one and this is the bad one. So I believe it's because the history of the application of, uh, of the materials has been, has always gone through without determining where and how it should perform. Like you can, yeah. pour, you can put one material on the same type of the turbine in two different places. But in one place, the tip of the speed, yeah. the speed of the tip will be one, and in another place, another. And rain amount in the year will be also different. Yeah. So this is why there might be mixed, you know, like feelings sure. about the materials and so on. What I also think it depends on the application because, yeah, not always it has been the, the perfect application method in a way that you know there's still human error and and you're still affected by the humidity and the weather around it. So. I believe if you're not applying the material as it should be applied, then don't expect good results in the end. And this is where the robotics really play a big role because we don't have that human error. Uh, everything is programmed set as it should be by the parameters. And, and yeah, I think this is a great stuff where the robots really benefit the industry. So consistency on leading edge protection material is really key to being successful with it. I've seen some images where they've done it by hand and it looks sort of wavy and a little uneven and it looks like they've touched it up a little bit so it's not what you would hope for yeah but the robot eliminates a lot of that yeah not only that um we know uh situations when the guys are eyeballing the material mm -hmm. uh, we know the situations when they are applied in temperatures which there shouldn't be applied oh the yeah center. sure so when we when the robot applies the material it has 12 cameras sensors of the humidity, sensors of the temperature on the surface of the, uh, of the air, uh, pressure of the air. So even if something fails after the year or two, we can go back in time and analyze the data about every square millimeter, how it was applied, what could possibly go wrong. All right. And so it's an open book okay. rather than, yeah, the material's bad. <laughs> Okay, and you so, have only one report in a PDF format, which yeah, doesn't, help. Yeah, doesn't help. So the, uh, yeah, that gets us the benefit of having so much data. Because we're still early in this process of leading edge protection, we don't know what we don't know. Obviously, the, the manufacturer of the material has recommendations about the temperature, humidity, and all those things. And so you want to make sure you're operating within that window. But not necessarily, that doesn't mean everything is always going to be perfect. But you at least can go back and look and refine the process as you go. I, I know. A lot of things that Aronis has done is you're just gathering data, right? You do yeah. hard things, you go do these campaigns, you learn a lot, and you do a lot of trials, and you bring that knowledge back for the next season. You've been doing that for a couple of years now, and it feels like just even looking at the robots uh, <laughs> now from a couple of years ago are much more refined. It, yeah. It's, yeah. it's like you, you know where the issues are going to be when you're out in service and how to avoid the so your, your reliability must be just going through the roof right now in terms of repairs and... There are like half a million of turbines all around the world, yeah. right? Yeah. So actually even less. Uh, so the quantity is not the key performance uh, indicator for us. Okay. The quality and the speed. We believe that the turbines are, bec we know that the turbines are becoming bigger. So they're becoming more efficient. So the <laughs> right. downtime more expensive. Uh, and also the seasonality when the job should be done is actually should be extended, not only in the summer season. True. So the robots True. can help to do that. And, uh, and so we are building our motto in the company is every next robot has to be better than the previous one. Not the quantity, but the quality and how well they're made, how efficient they are. Sure. how they're doing the job, like better and better and better. But, the same uh, applies to the service itself, because when we started out with lightning protection systems, as for example, we were doing one turbine a day, and we moved to two turbines a day, and, and now we are doing sometimes five turbines a day. But wow. for us, okay. the goal is not to lose the quality <laughs> at that point where we are making, you know, when we are going for the speed. 
and and I think this is yeah this is one of our goals and and where we are keeping ourselves on track that okay we want to improve that speed we want to lower that downtime of the tournament but we never want to lose the quality of, of what we're getting exactly uh, that is a nice transition to lightning protection systems uh, today I was telling you earlier that insurance people have come by our booth we do lightning protection obviously but uh, and when I say 20% of the LPS systems are broken and they're just astounded and then they say well how do you know that I says well because Dynas has gone off and measured thousands of blades and realized the data says roughly 20% maybe more are broken at any one time that's a huge problem still and I think that for, from the insurance industry and from the operator standpoint you, you get one of two options you send a technician up with a meter and you try to measure the resistance or you put something robotic up there and do it a lot faster yeah and i i'm assuming that based upon all your previous history that that lps measurement is becoming more routine or more accepted mm. so it should be more accepted there's just no way we can have 20 percent of lps systems broken that seems like a real industry problem from the insurance side the operator side it is it's not only industry problem but it's also our problem so what we understood like over the years that we are doing so many uh, like these lightning protection system tests and we are just bringing bad messages, right? So like, <laughs> hey guys, you have 20%, you have 15, you have 25%. Well, we are the bad news in the uh, industry. Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and so we understood that uh, industry needs a solution. If you're just bringing the bad news, it it's help. just, it doesn't help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and many customers were just coming back and just saying like, okay, 20% are broken, so so what so what should we do next? Like uh, we don't have the budget, we don't have any, you know, like programs how to treat this problem at, at, at all. Sure. Um, and so we are now implementing that robot, for example, if it's open circuit, it searches where exactly it's broken. Uh, we are developing the system to change the receptors. We have a lot of receptors with increased values, you know, like in in resistance or basically open circuit in the receptor. Okay. Um, yeah. We are building up the systems how to uh, improve lightning protection system by adding these diverters on, on uh, close to the receptors so so the lightning, you know, gets a smoother way. Uh, gets away, to the receptor, yeah. Yeah, sure. to, to the receptor and to the ground. Yeah. And uh, if we see oxidations, we have this oxidational curing system, like when we insert thousand volts and increasing the, the amperage and removing the oxidation and so on. Yeah. So now uh, we've built the best and the fastest uh, like lightning protection system measurement system. Sure. But now we're on the verge, like we're traveling the past, like how to solve that system, uh, that problem as well. We yeah. see that there is a problem, so there should be a solution. So, so what that's our motto now. What percentage can you clean up, repair on site and which ones where you just have a broken connection, someone's actually got to physically get in there and fix it? I would say half and half, uh, okay. half and half. And, uh, and the most ridiculous thing is that when it's open circuit and it's broken cable, it's just like half an hour to go into the root of the blade and connect the wire back. Which is oh, like so it's broken at the not at the tip end, but at the hub end. In most of the cases, the cable is broken in the hub, uh, not hub end, but but in root of the blade. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, and there are turbines where which are broken. The cables are broken in the tip area of the blade, but uh, still you have big percentage which you can repair right away in the same mobilization, just a half an hour, staying on that turbine for half an hour uh, longer. Okay. That's it. Okay, well, that seems like a, a big money saver. If, if you just need to connect the wire together yeah. and, and it's, it, it's, it's accessible, that seems like a real simple fix that yeah. you may not have ever caught before. Yeah. Okay, well, all right, that's remarkable. So a couple of the things that I know you're up to, and uh, I wrote a recent article in uh, PES Win magazine talking about internal blade inspections with Joel Saxon, the Wind Power Lab, and one of the key points is, hey, we got to be able to look inside these blades and see where there's structural deficiencies, there's a, where there's cracks, or maybe there's a, a bond joint that's let loose. Your automatic sort of robot car camera system—I don't even know what to call it anymore yeah. because it's got so much, so many brains on this on this vehicle. Uh, is really critical to that, to know what's going on inside structure. You want to just 
generally describe what this what do you what do you call this creature we started with basically with rv and the camera and okay. soon enough we understood that we find problems inside of the place and uh how big it is yeah you can't measure so we added up the lidar so which is actually creating a 3d model uh inside of the blade and okay. so when we see a crack we can measure it with a precision of millimeters and uh Afterwards, we understood that some of the pictures are overexposed or too dark. Overexposed right. like, like with the light or too dark, sure. too bright or too dark. And then we created the system that very powerful light, which is controlled by the LiDAR. So it's like dimming and adjusting the light based on how far and, and or close to the walls it is. Um, and in the end, like, many of the turbines have when they can't put the blade like completely horizontally so we add right. up like jet engine to to crawl up oh my a lot gosh of it times, does have a jet engine on yeah, the back there end is of this one thing. in here and and in a lot of times like you have actually a lot of oil inside of the blade which is yeah. of course not good but but that's yeah. the situation right so in order again to push the crawler forward we need extra power yeah so like it's, it's like the Batmobile in a sense, where it's got the rocket motor in the back of it. Yeah, it has the gyroscopes, <laughs> which is basically checking out if it's slipping or not, like and the angle and compensating the uh, gravity uh, automatically. And 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 all four wheels are also turning. So because some of the turbines, like particularly investors, they have these counterweights, and you have to right. go around them. Oh so sure. Go around them as smoothly as well. So camera looking up front camera looking back like qr code uh distance measurement with the radio signal <laughs> not with the you know like how many you know the the wire is yeah, yeah. Is, is is out and so but on all of those things are crucial i mean if you don't yes. know the distance where you are in the blade then almost what's the point yeah, well, you, you know? don't know yeah <laughs> where you need to cut up open the blade to repair inside and 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 then we got to Mexico and we started to do the job and, uh, you know, like it's too hot inside of the blade. Sure. So we added up like the cooling system so it's not overheating and we can perform the job also in Texas or Mexico. <laughs> so so that's basically step after step, but it's the most advanced like internal inspection crawler now in the industry. And uh, also the uh, another problem was that we were doing the inspections and a vast amount of data, like 30, 50 gigabytes, yeah. were gathered from one blade, not blade, but turbine, mm -hmm. and how to upload the data and verify the data and so on. So, and now all of the crews have like uh, 5G uh, modems, like Starlink uh, internet connections to upload the data. And so we can deliver the reports like in three days okay. after the inspection is done. Because if you think the turbines usually are nowhere like in a place right. where, where yeah, you know where you don't have the 5, 5g internet and things like right. that so we have the data but how do we get to the data for example from our headquarters in europe you know yeah. like <laughs> so this has been also uh, i think another era of our own to figure out how do we get the data in minutes and and how do we analyze it yeah so it's not just the technology of the crawler but the process itself how to work out the process uh, right it's very like yeah, it's, it's good for the customer. So this vehicle, which has more technology in it than the Cybertruck, <laughs> right? I mean, Elon Musk's got to look at this and go, well, you know, someday the Cybertruck will get to this level. Maybe we'll put yeah. si LiDAR on a Cybertruck, right? Yeah. We'll put a jet engine on the Cybertruck. He but, did actually. Uh, yeah? Yeah, he had, uh, not on the Cybertruck, but he uh, did on <laughs> Tesla, like, I don't remember the which one, but he, he made the uh, jet engine. Uh, to make it really? even faster, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> so there's the, all this technology is through this what we call in America the school of hard knocks, right? You 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 learn as you go, but it looks like at this point you've learned plenty, yeah. and and you've accomplished. Uh, you took it in that data, made adjustments to where you have a very robust system. I think the same thing yeah. from your. Uh, LEP system and also the LPS system measurements are just very robust. So you get out into remote areas yeah. and the system works. Yeah. So that and that drives then I want to get to the customer experience. So the customer experience is really key right now. Right. So the customers, the operators are always in a pinch. You know, it's 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 a tough world out there and they're just trying to make sure that the wind turbines are running and that they're profitable. 
you come in, it's, we, we can do these really important measurements, repairs, uh, inspections faster, with more data, uh, with uh, more, uh, be able to resolve issues quicker than I've seen from pretty much anybody else. So from a customer's satisfaction standpoint, they just got to be thrilled, like, hey, you, you can do my wind farm, you can measure all my LPS, my wind farm in a, in a couple of days. You can get the LEP system fixed in uh, maybe a couple of weeks if I have 100 turbines, yep. or whatever it is. That's got to be huge. Uh, we believe so, top, so, uh, so too, um, and, but there is a change in the industry, right, which needs to happen. Like, uh, like all the industry is doing like drone inspections and based on that, the repair campaigns. Right. So what to do if we have more data and smarter decisions, like uh, the, the industry needs to change as well, the perspective, like sure. how to actually treat the data, how to work with it and, and how to make the decisions. But as simple as that, like one, one simple example, like if you have just a drone inspection and you see, let's say half a meter crack mm -hmm. on the blade, you have options to do based on your knowledge, what sure. decisions you make, right? Based on where the crack is, what type of the blade, what type of, uh, what type of the blade and so on. And let's say we add up like internal inspection and we don't see anything from inside, then you have one decision. Right. Yeah, you do. But we add up, let's say we go and do the internal inspection and we see three meter long crack in the same place. It's completely another decision. Right. Right. So this is basically perspective what we see that the industry wants to become smarter and wants to make smarter decisions. So to do smarter decisions, you need smarter technology. And this is what we're bringing on on the table. Yeah. Also, the LPS, as you know, like the, the industry is not used to 20% bad news, right? So right, what right, should yeah. we do? Like, uh, hey, but it's insured, so insurance will cover this. Um, Tricky. Insurance company, companies are also not stupid. They are also thinking, hey, right. we have such a huge, you know, like expenses because of the lightning. So we should do something about that. Right. And we think that the industry will change for the smarter decisions rather than yeah. staying where it is right now. But well, that's that's totally valid. I think I think you're kind of getting around the same point that we hear on the lightning side. If I do X, how does my life change as an engineer working at an operator or a technician at yeah. an operator? If I do this, how does my life change tomorrow, next week, next month? Th that's sort of the, the level that they're at right now. And that's a reasonable question. If I do these LPS inspections, what happens? Yeah. Well, I, I, I get it fixed and I don't have all these crazy lightning problems. Yeah. Right? My life changes because I don't have to keep fussing with this system that's making me crazy. Yeah. Uh, the same thing on blade inspections. If I can do this blade inspection and I might know my blades are okay for the next 12 months or six months, whatever the time span is, I don't have to run around trying to get somebody in here to fix a blade in an emergency situation. Right? Yeah. And so it's that life altering path of I don't have to do X anymore. I've taken this off my plate because these engineers and technicians are just too busy. Yeah. It sounds like this whole array of robots is it, the intent of all this is to relieve some of that pressure from the yeah. operators. Of course, it's faster, safer. Sure. Which is also important uh, point in the in the robotics, and and gives more data. As mm. simple as that. And of course, the human needs time to verify the data, understand the data like to put it together and so on. I think in general for the industry, I think we are still a very young industry. Like if, if you know, we are looking at it and, and there was a point where, where it all just started, where people thought, you know, they're not going to need to maintain the turbines. They just build them and they just run, you know, amazing. Yeah, great. And, and then afterwards, like, okay, they were doing the visual inspections. And then at one point the drones came in and now drones, it's like, you know, kind of like waking up in the morning, <laughs> you know, that's what you do reg on a regular basis. You do the drone inspections. I will say, though, on the, on the issue of drone inspections, I think that's an interesting point. Having walked around American Clean Powder today, wow. there are very few drone companies here. Two years ago or a year ago, even a year ago, we were in San Antonio, a lot more drone companies here. That has dwindled dramatically because the drones only provide a snapshot, right? Yeah. There, what do you do with the data? If you can't get on the turbine and do a repair, do something quick to get the everything back in service again, then 
Yeah. It's helpful, but is, is it as helpful? Is it helpful enough? Yeah. It's that's an interesting observation. Yeah. Like one of the things what we compare to, uh, like the any industry, like uh, health industry, right? Yeah. So how the health industry has changed with introducing the X-ray, ultrasound, yes, MRI, absolutely. et cetera. So this is gonna happen also in the wind industry. Sure. It will sure. need time, yeah. but internal, external, LPS, X-rays, ultrasound, it's gonna happen. With the size of the blades, with the problems which will, you know, like increase exponentially, if there is no technology which will come into the industry and will not help, yeah. Uh, then it's gonna it's slow gonna down the industry. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah. We'll all be fixing blades all the time, and which is not what the point is. The point is to produce power. Now, it, 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 I think your point is well, well taken as we move even offshore, right? So the offshore, you're seeing some development this year up towards yeah. my neck of the woods in Massachusetts. Offshore, riskier, bigger turbines, little access. It gets harder to obviously to get yeah. to the turbine itself. I know you've been working on some offshore concepts. I've seen some of them. Where's the status on the offshore? Uh, June, we are doing tests. Oh, wow. June, we are doing tests. Yeah. What part of the world? Can you announce that? Uh, in Europe. In, in Europe. Europe? Yeah, yeah. Ooh, okay. That's uh, exciting. It is. <laughs> yeah, it's like, but to be, yeah. By the way, we are doing now uh, internal inspections in offshore. Okay. We have the drone inspections also for the offshore and off on onshore, like to combine the data drone and internal and yeah, LPS, just, like in, in, in one platform. That's, that's a good idea. Um, uh, but yeah, everything else, like in offshore, the biggest challenge is leading edge erosion, of course. Yes. Uh, and we are now verifying the technology, like, like scaling the technology in the onshore. And then, that, then that's the time when you, you need to go into the offshore, right? Yes. So. Yeah. Repair thousands of turbines in onshore and then try to do that offshore. Makes Any sense. Any test in offshore costs you freakingly a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So we want to, t to do like verification of the technology in onshore. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, and, and then move to offshore. Wow. And I think it's also going to be a big help for the industry because if you look at the offshore, the maintenance window, it's so much smaller than onshore yeah. because of the weather. And again, robots, it's, it's a piece of metal, you know, like a piece of steel. It, it, it can like swing there as much as it wants, as much as we need. Like nothing's going to happen. Probably just a couple of hundreds, thousands of dollars, but not a human, like not a person's life, you know. So I, I think it's, again, going to be a complete new switch in the industry. I'm really impressed at the number of robots that are here. Just looking at some of the details, I mean, the, just the cameras and the actuators and all the systems and the, I know there's a lot of engineering involved here, so yeah. that, that's amazing. And it's where the industry- people are working day and night. Eight, uh, eight, zero, eight, yeah, eight, zero, yeah. Oh my gosh, okay, yeah. wow. To develop this. And they're all in Latvia working day and night, I assume, yeah. trying to get these robots. Literally day and night sometimes, yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm really glad to see you, you come to New Orleans. This is fantastic. Uh, I'm really glad to see the robots and see you two here. So uh, thanks for being on the podcast, Greta, Dana. This is fantastic. Thank I, you for having us. And I hope to get to I hope to get to Latvia this summer. Please. Yeah, we're, we're, we're working on <laughs> it's it. It's an amazing country, honestly. Yeah.